Delhi. Welcome to the orientation of the AIML club at Delhi. Uh, I am Ramneet. Uh, and I'm Nilchar. Uh, today we'll be taking you through the AIMLC orientation. Uh, so before so we start with the questions, there is one important question that we receive that we have to answer. Yep. So the answer was flashed just before this. The answer is obviously yes. Okay. So let's begin with the formal orientation now. Um, Nilsar will take you through the first set of slides. Okay. So like you know, this club is called AIMLC. So you can guess the, the full name AIML. So Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning Club. So when talking about AI ML first, like, I mean, we feel that it's a responsibility to walk you through the basics, which is like, what is AI? So when talking about AI, people usually think like these are human destroying robots and like, which will kill all of humanity and like take over and do fancy things like talk and walk and like take on shapes and whatever, hack computers in seconds. But come on, like, these are not real, okay? So like at present, we are struggling with building like solutions for simplest of the simplest systems and like there are difficulties in this field but so like to formally state ai is basically the study of intelligent agents that perceive the environment and take suitable actions to maximize their goal so like they have some sort of decision decision making capabilities uh, it's different from algorithmic programming uh, because like the decisions they take are not always based on full information. It can be based on partial information as well. So, and these decisions are based on some sort of heuristics. Like uh, we, we don't always know right going up ahead in the future, but we have a sort of intuition. So that is what AI is all about. And like talking about the fancy stuff that they show in movies, like it's the category of artificial general intelligence. Uh, so like it still remains a very distant dream for like most researchers and i mean i don't think like we'll see it in some say like five years from now or ten years it's still some distance uh, like up ahead and then talking about ml machine learning so what is machine learning it's basically the theory of making a machine learn I mean, as evident from the name more formally if you say like it's a class of algorithms that are given a set of experience and a learning task and a performance measure so you have experience in the form of data usually and task is the problem you are dealing with and then you have a performance like which can be accuracy or prediction how good is the prediction so these these are the parameters that they take in and kind of give you an algorithm that go over the data and predict something out of it so that is all about machine learning so it has three parts, supervised learning and supervised and reinforcement learning. So we'll talk about them in upcoming days, but like then people often confuse machine learning with deep learning. So this is what I would like to point out here. So deep learning is basically a part of machine learning. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a class of algorithms that deals with neural networks. So it's, it's, it's a subclass of machine learning. You can say it's a part of it. So that is it about AI and ML. So next we come to uh, why why AI MLC basically. So I mean, why at all? Like why do we need this club? And more importantly, why we need the skills? So you can guess like AI ML. Uh, like these are the two like mo most emerging fields in industrial revolution 4.0 and probably in 5.0 as well. So talking about industrial revolution 4.0, we see that like we know about industrial revolutions, right? So first there were factories, mechanization, and then there were electricity and then basic automation. And now we are going through industry 4.0. So this is the age of intelligent automation. So we need machines to make decisions, which traditionally humans made and mind you, like these decisions can be very complex. Like suppose you are dealing with a uh, production facility. So there can be things like temperature, pressure, 
the power supply motor speeds and there are multiple of these factors going in the background and it is often not possible or economical for humans to i mean look through all of this and make the best decision possible but because now we have the data and we have the algorithms and we have the computing power most importantly so we can make uh, machines learn from the data we can make machines take decisions for us and sometimes they are even better than human performance so and like as we go forward more jobs are being created in this field and there are ample opportunities in industry so this is a very important skill and like uh, so this demand is growing and it is not just uh, uh, just limited to the uh, you know like uh, in uh, traditional courses like computer science or electrical engineering or so it it's it's uh, i mean it's seeing applications all across all over the domains like there are applications in medical research i mean it has a long standing history with medical research machine learning has been used in multiple use cases in medical research uh, then you know, even chemical engineers do use machine learning nowadays like uh, i read a, a paper in which they improve the batteries of uh, the performance of batteries using machine learning uh, recently in 2020 we saw uh, the covid uh, pandemic and it's still going on so in covid the vaccines were developed ai was used to develop vaccines how if you say it's basically i mean vaccines are um, taken from like to develop a vaccine and or a drug say uh, so like you have a pool of molecules that you can probably use but then and it's difficult figuring out there are billions of molecules which can potentially i mean cure the disease but then ai can you uh, can be used to you know sort out filter out some orders of magnitudes of molecules and then come to a handful of it which researchers can then take forward so this was done with covid and several other diseases it, i mean drug research has been given a great impetus by ai and then in california in 2020 there was a wildfire so i did a report a report in which machine learning was used to predict um, the patterns of fire like which parts of the forest is more prone to fire and that saved millions of lives so that is a i mean that is the huge demand this fields i mean are seeing and like these are important skills going forward in the future so i'll hand over to ramnit from here uh, he will take you through the next two points right so the third point is really uh, the main reason why we started this club so our college right now has a club for a web development and software development in general uh, the club has uh, the college has a club for uh, coding and competitive coding and algorithms uh, however the, we lacked a dedicated community to deal with fields like uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning um so the reason really was that uh, a lot of my friends almost everyone that i see uh, on linkedin uh, everyone that i meet virtually in classes uh, most of them are interested in these fields a lot of them are doing uh, some amazing work in these fields i know a lot of seniors who are doing some amazing work in these fields we have uh, professors here we have the school of ai at iit delhi and so we really it's not like we didn't we it's not like we don't have people who are doing amazing work in these fields we have the people we have a pretty vibrant community here uh, who is doing um amazing ground breaking work in various areas of artificial intelligence um a cursory look at the professors who are working in the fields of ai um can just can tell you the variety and depth that we that we have so our aim with this club really is to bring all of that together is to uh, create a place where anyone who is interested in the fields of ai and ml can come and they can find something that is valuable for them whatever their level is they can find something uh, that is valuable for them and the fourth point is really <laughs> because iit bombay has one right so that that's the starting point for any club in any college is iit bombay has one um next we move to um yeah sorry so next we move to what we aim to do right so as i pointed out right our main our main goal here our, our main vision here is to have a community where 
uh, anyone who is interested in these fields can come they can learn they can share their thoughts and ideas right so if you if you find some amazing new application of ai and ml and we want you to have a place where you can come and share that if you have the next great startup idea for ai and ml we want you to have a place where you can come you can discuss it you can flesh it out right you can you can collaborate with other people and that's the the beauty of a community really is that once you create it it is self serving and the community grows it makes everyone grow with it and uh, that's our aim with the club secondly we aim to reduce the entry barrier in these fields right so we understand that it is difficult to get into these fields it is difficult to know uh, how to start learning it is difficult to know what to do it is difficult to know what kind of projects to take up right we we understand because we ourselves are facing those things and what we want to do is to leverage as i said right we have we've got some amazing seniors we have uh, some amazing professors right so uh, as as a as a part of the community what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to take all of that knowledge right all of the the depth of knowledge that we have uh, here at iit delhi and you'll be able to interact with them you'll be able to give your own contributions uh, to the knowledge here at iit delhi right and so that that to be i believe that is one of the main selling points of our club right um as undergraduates you can often feel like you don't have a lot to give to the community you you can often feel like you just not skilled enough to do anything worthwhile right but we believe that when you come into contact with uh, people who are doing amazing work right so the person that we have today um once you come into contact with people like that and especially if you're in the first year and you're in and you're in contact with a person like that right we believe that this really this really accelerates your period of growth this really accelerates uh, the time that you take to do something meaningful to do something substantial and so we believe that this club will help you make a difference uh, as cliched as that sounds um next we want to promote collaboration and and organic growth right we so the collaboration is really what i'll what i'll stress upon here all right um what i have found personally is that uh, there is a lack of people discussing and talking with each other um about what they found new in these fields and um what what their ideas are what they want to do as projects right so we we aim to facilitate that collaboration and we aim to help you connect with people that can uh, help you flesh out your ideas that can help you learn something and all of you can grow together ultimately we want to be the one stop solution for all students that are interested in ai or ml uh and next come to what the plan uh, of amlc is right so now a lot of these points here are self explanatory right we'll have workshops for beginners we will we're going to have some hackathons uh, uh on practical applications and discussion sessions on recent developments we have the talks guest lectures and podcasts we have released one podcast already we have several more in the pipeline and uh the point that i would like to emphasize here is that uh in academia and industry all right so we uh, consciously are thinking about this and we uh want to emphasize that we uh, we're not a research group we're not a paper reading group so we're not going to be focusing only on academia uh we're also not a startup we're also not going to be focusing on uh only industry right so what we want to do is to give you the best of both worlds so we want to have leading experts in uh, academia say professors right uh, and we also want to have people who are uh, leading the companies right who are leading big companies that are doing work in these fields and so uh, this is an essential part of our plan is to have people with diverse experiences and when i say diverse experiences i mean that in uh, in every sense all right so what does that mean that means that uh, i we want to have on people who are doing work in different areas of artificial intelligence and machine learning right so we 
uh, often this can sound like an umbrella term however it's it's a very very wide area and so we want to cover people who are doing work in every aspect of this uh, in every area we also want to cover people with diverse backgrounds uh, you're going to find a lot of people in our sessions who are not from um, computer science or electrical engineering backgrounds however they got into this field and so we want to provide um, all of the the benefit of the experience of all of those people to you then so this is going to be probably our main our main um, part of the plan is the theme based content all right so what we're going to do is for every semester we're going to have a theme and uh, what are examples of themes themes can be something like uh, ai in healthcare or ai for social good right or ai for finance so we're going to choose a theme and we're going to focus on that theme for for one semester what we're going to do is uh, build up right from the basics right so from ground zero we're going to build up and we're going to take this journey together and by the end we hope to do something significant something substantial uh, in in the in that field in that theme right so along the way there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of content that we'll provide to you a lot of interactive sessions that we'll have we'll have workshops on the practical aspects of working in those themes and what you can do we will have blog posts that will guide you through what the main areas that are used in it are so for example if computer vision is something that is used a lot in healthcare uh, in the in ai in healthcare then we're going to have blog posts and workshops and sessions on introducing computer vision to you and what it is and then we're going to build on uh, we're going to build on that and we're going to show you how computer vision is then used in healthcare and what are the specific aspects of it that become uh, very important for healthcare right so we're also then going to have podcasts with people who are working in these themes and it's all going to be rounded up by a session with someone who is uh, a leading industry professional or a researcher in in that field right okay? um so that was so that's that's what we'll do for you right but learning is not complete without doing it yourself as you know so at the end we're also going to have a a, a hackathon or a project right where uh, where we're going to apply everything that we have learned over the semester and we hope to do something substantial to build something significant using all that knowledge um nitesh is going to guide you through the next point yeah so the uh, let's let's switch back to the previous slide uh, so like in this case uh, like talking about the project so i would like to mention a point here that is uh, we have dev clubs doing projects so like why like we are focusing on projects then like and what is the difference between the projects done by dev club and our club so in this projects the focus will be to build ai ml based backbones for useful systems like uh, we are not going to focus on you know ui ux uh, designs or website designs or things like that we are going to focus on the ai ml backbone of the technology uh, we plan to solve the challenges faced by the campus community using these technologies and as ramnit said also about uh, about the themes we can have projects based on that so like it's different because like our focus will be as i said in ai and ml and you know ai and ml is much different from coding uh, some people would think that you need a lot of coding to do ai ml but it is not true what you need to do ai ml is basically some idea about some basic mathematics and basic coding but what you mostly need is to i mean the passion to learn and uh, read things and find out things and then kind of build your own creative solutions because every data set is different and they need i mean different models to train on so so it's uh, so it's all about like how we apply things uh, apply the principles of ai and ml and into these problems and you know the pipeline of a machine learning uh, usually involves data collection cleaning then manual inspection and annotation then applying algorithms building a model as you would say and then 
uh, kind of experimenting on the model and trying out different things and see what works best. So all these things will be our primary focus. We won't be focusing on that much on the development side of the thing uh, in the sense that we won't be, I mean, building things which look very, I mean, I mean, which are very fancy or say, I mean, very user friendly or things like that. That won't be our focus. Our focus will be on the AI ML side of things. So, yeah, so the next uh, will So the next slide we'll see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Ranmeet will talk you through this, how we you can be a part of the club and what is it I mean, in for you. Right, so the, so the one thing that a lot of you had questions about uh, recruitment and how we're going to add more members. So what we want to say is that we, we're going to be an open club. Um, the reason for that is that we don't want to have, say, 25 people uh, that there only there are only those 25 people that are learning and uh, that that we are working with. Uh, we want to be able to have uh, each one of you, um, whatever your level is, have some growth through this club. And we, we want to be able to provide something of value to each of you. So if you are an IIT Delhi student that are interested in ARML, you're already a part of it, whether you like it or not. Um, we, 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 we believe in creating uh, an open community where, uh, where everyone can learn, uh, whether, whether you have previous experience, whether you don't, whether you are a member of the club, whatever that means, whether you're not, all right. So everyone is free to participate in all our events. Now, a question that can can be asked that you can ask is then how are you going to manage projects, right? So the answer to that is uh, any projects, any development projects uh, or projects for IIT Delhi that we take up, uh, we're going to float a form and anyone who's interested to work in the, in those projects with us um, can fill the form and uh, then we can come and then you can come and you can work together with us uh, on on those projects. All right. Now, another important part is that we don't want this to be a one way flow between us and you. Uh, we understand that uh, there are a lot of people in the community that are doing some amazing work that would want to showcase their work or that would want um, to create something new. Right. So if you are someone who wants to take a tutorial on, on a particular topic, or if you are someone who wants to showcase your recent research paper, if you are someone who wants to build a project who has an idea for a project that we haven't taken up and we haven't thought of, um, please raise a request with our team, right? So we're going to have hostile WhatsApp groups. We have a Discord server. You're going, you, can, you can send that request anywhere and our team members are going to facilitate that project for you essentially. And we're going to help you do that. And that is how we, we believe that having an open community um, can also benefit you in, in terms of projects and it's not going to be a disadvantage. All right. And so in the next slide, we'll come to in the, yeah, so finally we'll round up things. Um, so most of the things have been spoken of. So lastly, I would like to say a very a few points keep it as short as possible uh, so like AIML is the emerging technology that is transforming lives every day right and there are ample opportunities of research as well as in the industry across domain knowledge will be very helpful as you know like AIML is much more about practical as well as about theoretical so there is no i mean i mean uh, as such there is no distinction between what is practical and what is theoretical like people are publishing papers about using ml in different fields and then there are people who are publishing results uh, on algorithms and in ml and things like that so there are core researches going on there are applied researches going on and everything is a part of ai ml so cross domain knowledge is particularly uh, is going to benefit you like you can take up these principles of AI and ML and put it in the domain you want to work on or is your major area of work. And so like there's not really any boundary and limitations as to what AI ML can do. And so we at AI MLC, we strive to be a conducive community for all AI ML enthusiasts in IIT Delhi. And, uh, but then 
the thing is the success of the community lies in active participation right we need your participation and engagement so that we all can learn and grow organically we would like to stress here that much of the developments in this field has come through collaboration and not competition so so we strive to promote collaboration and encourage everyone to share their views ideas and work so that the community as a whole can learn and grow you know like it's not a zero sum game right i mean you won't be like <laughs> discord or graded down if you write a paper jointly uh, here i mean collaboration will come to your benefit actually because you can do much more productive work than working alone and these things are pretty complex as you go higher up and then like i mean having a, a group of people like-minded people working towards the same goal will actually benefit you and make something fruitful come out of it so finally i'd like to say that i mean so we have here at a, uh, come to mlc join us join the revolution and make a difference thank you so right yeah. so we're just waiting for the speaker to join us till then i think we can take uh, questions and uh, richard can answer your questions in the meanwhile uh, Anirudha uh, has raised a hand. Let me ask you to unmute. Hi. So, does data science also come under the ambit of uh, AIMLC since it tied a lot with you know machine learning and all those concepts? Okay. So, if, we understand if you the data science yeah. project. Can we share it with you guys and stuff? Okay. So. Thing is, uh, data science is quite similar to machine learning, you would say, because machine learning also deals with data. But as such, you know, like there's a distinction where you can feel like machine learning is also about the algorithms you use to process that data, right? And data science can sometimes be about doing some statistics out of the data or things like that, uh, like things which do not involve uh, algorithms of AI and ML. So in that case, I mean, of course, data science can be any, uh, like, a, it's a, I mean, there's no clear distinction as to, I mean, where ML ends and data science starts. So yes, we think we can accommodate that, but then, I mean, we would like if it has more AI and ML things in it, and I mean, comes within the ambit of AI and ML. So that is it. Uh, all right, uh, sir has just joined. Uh, I think Professor Sankar Pal has joined us. Um, welcome, sir. Uh, I'm I'm going to give a short introduction, uh, and, and then we can have the talk begin uh, by Professor Pal. Just a minute. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the main event of the evening. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing to you uh, our chief guest for the event, Professor Sankar Kumar Pal. To most of you here, uh, I'm sure the man needs no introduction. I will attempt to still give one for the rest, though any combination of words will probably fall short to give this man an introduction. Professor Pal is an internationally renowned computer scientist uh, whose areas of research include machine intelligence, soft computing, and pattern recognition. He has had a long and distinguished career, having worked at UC Berkeley and uh, as Fulbright Fellow at the NASA Johnson Space Center, uh, among other places. He was the first computer scientist, as well as someone outside mathematics and statistics, to become director of ISI Calcutta. Uh, in its 76 year history. He was awarded the Padma Shri in Science and Engineering in 2013 by the President of India for uh, his contributions to the field of machine intelligence. It is indeed a privilege to, for all of us to be here today and listen to him. And without further ado, uh, I present to you uh, Professor Sankar Kumar Pal. 
Thank you. Is it now visible? Hello? Uh, no, it isn't visible yet, sir. It's visible right now. Is it okay now? Yes, sir. It's visible. Okay. Good evening. Ah. Thanks for inviting me to your artificial intelligence and machine learning club of IIT Delhi. Uh, let me tell you, these names are big, actually becoming uh, buzzword nowadays. Eh? So that's why I, I have chosen to talk about my experience since 1975, how this subject has evolved today. And if you have any question, please let me know. Uh, I will not go through any, just mathematics, just some concepts and my experience entirely. You may or may not agree also. So my journey started in March 1975. So it is already over 45 years, going to be 60, 46. And work was related to pattern recognition. That time, there was no book, no journal that time. No course, giving course does not arise, pattern recognition. And then five set theory, that was also a very new topic. So when I joined my ISI, how I faced the challenge and without any journal and book, that's how I addressed. And the question of uncertainty modeling or any kind of data. And then that crisis of using Fuzzy set theory, because probability theories, they did not like it. And I was working in an institute called Statistical Institute. So they are, we don't have any ITP transaction journal, anything there. They are all statistics and mathematics. But still those directors helped me to develop this subject. That is the beauty of our institute. So then I will show how it has evolved to soft computing and then machine intelligence. And we formed our unit in 1973, 1993, March in ISI, based on the school of thought that we started developing since 1975. Then the concept of granular computing and the data mining became a buzzword around 2000. Then some, uh, some of the recent applications I will explain as an example. And then I'll show the challenging issues. Because when you work at any discipline, you have to keep at least five years ahead. So there comes the question of big data analytics, computation theory of perception, natural computing, and of course, deep learning. Without deep learning, nowadays, no talk on AI or data science, machine learning, which is complex. At the same time, I will talk about some caution, positive sense, caution that has to be very taken care of because now subject has evolved to data-driven science. So these are all integrated subject. Without machine learning, you cannot do data science. Without data science, it has, it has no value. There are two challenges. One is called classification, one is called clustering. What is classification? You are giving a sampled information, there may be incomplete information about the classes. 
and your challenge is to estimate the region, entire region of the pattern class based on this sample, based on this incomplete information. So this, that means it has twofold task, abstraction of information from the incomplete information, and then make it generalize. This is the challenge. Whereas on the other end, in case of clustering, you are given the entire data set, but no information about classes, no information about their origin. And the challenge is to partition into meaningful homogeneous region. The word meaningful is subjective. That's why you get any kind of solution. Here the number of regions may be unknown or known. Number of regions, but you don't know which class are there. So this is called clustering. So this is called supervised learning. This is called unsupervised learning. So the learning concept originated from that Learning means you are learning the abstraction parameters of the classifier. Here also you are learning the parameters of the unsupervised classifier, that means centroid, mean, covariance matrix, etc. Now next comes to fuzzy set. What is fuzzy set? I, I mentioned to you that paper had about now 96,000 citations. Was Zade who has passed away at the age of 68. It has this characteristic, fuzzy sets are nothing but membership functions. I'm not going into detail unless you ask me later. Membership functions is context dependent. And this membership function, it is, it is, is responsible for flexibility of the system. And it is responsible for uncertainty analysis. That means when the data set are overlapping, concepts are overlapping, regions are overlapping, which are in, inherited in any kind of data, real life data. So fuzzy set become very much useful since then. But fuzzy set was explained by a mathematician and an electrical engineer, not considering pattern recognition. But what is the difference between membership function and the probability? Just for the information, probability depends on the number of occurrence of an element. Membership function depends on the concept of similarity of an imprecise concept with an object. So, so here, nothing is about the number of occurrence of an element. So it, membership of an element where position A means the degree to which the object is matching or similar with the, con with the imprecise concept as represented by position. Whereas probability occurrence means to what number of probability depends on the number of occurrences. So this is the basic difference between the two. Now, what was the challenge when I joined? Bringing out the, this root relation between fuzzy set, abstract concept of fuzzy set to pattern recognition and image processing. So that gave the rise, the birth rise of multi-class belonging. That means a pattern can belong to more than one class. Previously, we assumed a pattern can belong to either a class or not, zero or one. But here we say, no, it has the possibility of belonging to any class with a matter of degree any value from 0 to 1, any value from 0 to 1. Similarly, in image, when I moved to Imperial College for my other PhD, because image processing was very hard to do in India, even in developed countries also, only few uh, localized centers were there. So this is an image, a gray image. So you can see that I cannot define the exact boundary of the classes, because it is gray. So therefore, it can be treated as a fuzzy set. That means a grayscale image with sinusoidal gray value gradation and is a fuzzy boundaries, fuzzy region. So based on this concept, entire fuzzy image processing, entire fuzzy video processing, that means concept of boundaries, regions, edges, corners, relations, they do not lend themselves to this aspect. They are nothing to do with probability. So first paper in Eric Raspini from Stanford Research Institute, which had published information control in 1969, clustering should be fuzzy, not crisp. That means any pattern can have origin from more than one class. But then based that and done, they initiated a new direction of fuzzy clustering, fuzzy data. And our paper appeared in 1977. 
1977 first from our institute this is on speech recognition similarly it is a lady professor judith prewitt she first mentioned in 70 that image segmentation should be a fuzzy subset and rosenfeld and his group at the university of maryland college park whom i visited as a fulbright fellow that time they, ex they extended the concept to digital geometry and myself and my second adv phd advisor robert king from imperial College, we had electronic letters a very prestigious journal that time from iw publications on image enhancement so that's the subject was growing so we had several examples application speech recognition because speech is a pattern of biological origin and it in many fields several kinds of fuzziness the same word when you utter in the morning or in the evening it changes same word when you utter in a good mood or bad mood the frequency changes so it is nothing to do with the probability so the medical image mri x-ray they have great amount of overlapping concept remote sensing natural language. these are so many applications now in late crisis in physiologic research this is a new topic everybody is publishing just like the ai whatever you publish right you publish publish but after that it gets saturated so research got start in mid 80s main criticism was membership function how do you add membership function though you call it yes just like probability ranking function which you derive from the data you can also have but the japanese product of physiologic control came in first japanese product of physiologic is a sandai subway that means without holding the strap the, you don't have any kind of jerk. It smoothly starts, smoothly stops. That is the first physiologic operation in Sendai, Japan. Then reappearance of artificial neural network. Artificial neural network once died, then again came in 87, 88, and learning. Again, after five to uh, after seven to ten years, it's desert. Yeah. I I will tell again. An introduction of genetic algorithm, searching optimization. So these have reappeared, introduction, then physiology started, flourished again at a higher gear. Then I typically follow up, then all funding agencies, from, even from India, because India always has been a follower of developed country. We did not have any funding before for physiology. But then when all integration started coming and America's also putting fund, then India government also started funding any kind of project came forward, conference held in conjunction with other paradigm. Any conference you go in around that time, 1990s, all just uh, uh, neural network. So many journals came forward. The ITP transaction came forward. They produced Competition Intelligence Society and other journals. So subject has now stability. Now look at this. Then late 80s, scientists thought, why not integration? Because I said has uh, some limitation. Neural net has some limitation because how to determine the parameters. Genetic algorithm has limitation. So if we can make judiciously integration, maybe we will be able to survive. So there are all kinds of permutation combinations started getting published. If you look at the journal that time, so many papers coming out. Physiologic, ANN, ANN, GA, combination, etc. Rough set hasn't account yet. But among those, neurophysic hypertension was the first and most visible integration. That's why you get shopping, neurophysic camcorder, neurophysic vacuum cleaner, neurophysic television, and so on, so on. All because of the, of the Japanese integration. Now, what is neurophysic? Because that is very interesting. Because scientists thought, including my group from ISI, the physical theory models try to mimic human reasoning and the capability of handling uncertainty. On the other hand, neural networks can attempt to emulate architecture and information representation to of human brain. So if Fuzzyset provides the software, neural net provides kind of hardware, it's, it's, it's a very holy concept. So therefore, we can have integration in the name of neural biology. So too many publications coming up again, and However, within five to six years, we realize that it's not that easy to model our architecture and information representation of human brain, including myself. But 
On the other hand, it has certain characteristics which any design engineer would love to have in his or her system. What are those characteristics? Adaptivity, that we adjust to change in environment, information, new data. That means just like human being, any new environment, they can adjust. Speed, higher massive parallelism, fault tolerance to missing, confusion, noise data, ruggedness to failure components, no nodes, etc. Even if you cut link one node or node, it still works. That means if you get hurt in your brain, you do not die. It's a restfully degradation, optimality. And more importantly, from pattern nation point of view, machine learning point of view, it learns from examples. It, it doesn't need any mathematical framework. You give X and Y, input X, output Y, input A, output B. It encodes this relation, whatever may be the complication, the non-linearity, into its network parameter. That relation, that property made it useful to widely. Not widely, I should say it's a big hope without knowing the intricacy of the neural network. Everybody thinks that since there is a uh, machine learning problem, input, output, you bring neural network, you will bring neural network. So any kind of bank uh, assessment, uh, your uh, risk management, health insurance, everybody started applying without looking into the theory. So this is the first example we made from our institute, which received an outstanding paper award by Tripoli. Simple concept. This is a neural multilayer perceptron you buy from the market, and it has capability only to accept input in zero one numerical. But in linguistic, but in natural sense, we need linguistic output also input also. Low, medium, high. When you go to doctor, you tell your symptoms in terms of uh, linguistic terms. Doctor, my temper temperature is high, pressure is low, etc. So input here. Output, it could be overlapping. Therefore, if I take the judicious integration of the nonlinear boundary capability, generation capability of neural network, because it can model any kind of relation between X and Y, and uncertainty handling capability of fuzzy set theory, then we can end up with a fuzzy neural network, which handles uncertainty arising from overlapping concept, which takes imprecise input, it back propagates up based on the appropriate weightage depending on the mu value at one. Because otherwise, standard uh, gradient descent says what you do. You take the output and then from that node you back propagate. But here we back propagate to all nodes depending on the membership value at every node. That instead of making zero and or one, we consider all values. It can handle linguistic input in addition to multilayer percent. Therefore, if you consider the speech recognition problem, six vowel classes, just like in uh, Bengali, we have a six vowel classes. Telugu also have six vowel classes. Classifier score, base classifier, 79, neural nets with different nodes, testing, training, look at this. Testing, it has increased. Training also increased, mostly. But it takes 20% linguistic patterns in calculating. So this is a very simple concept we gave in 92 that time, and this received the outstanding paper award, and also it's a highly cited paper. Now look at this. According to defined in 1993 in our institute, machine intelligence. What is a machine intelligence? A core concept of grouping pattern recognition and learning with all those advanced tools. And this tool list is not exhaustive. Depending on the time, it can add it. Fuzzy logic, rough set, probabilistic reasoning, approximate reasoning, case-based reasoning. Because without reasoning, no intelligence would be, would be complete. And these are all kinds of integration, the data-driven system, features relationship system. And it's called its core concept of grouping various advanced technologies with data rational. And any intelligent autonomous systems means nothing but physical embodiment of machine intelligence. And why we are Scientists are trying to publish all kinds of integration to find the best match. Then Zade defined 1994 in communication SCM journal, soft computing. What is the it's a different way of synergistic integration of fuzzy logic, neural network, genetic algorithm to address the specific application. 
that piece of merit which you cannot achieve by using individual tools alone. If you can, if you if you judiciously integrate, then you get the better result. But that concept we already we already started about four to five years before, because because our paper that was ninety two, but we started working in ninety because to get a paper published from that time at least two years after sending. So that's what's called soft copy. What is the concept of soft copy? So to find an approximate solution to an imprecisely or precisely formulated. That means it exploits the tolerance for imprecision, uncertainty, approximate reasoning, and partial truth in order to achieve the four properties tractability, robustness, low solution cost, and close resemblance in imitation. Whatever name you give, this should be your objective for handling any kind of data. For example, when you drive a car, when you make a parallel parking, do you go by the precise mathematics that you need to park your car exactly living six inches from footpath and in between two? No. You do it roughly. So that means the high precision carries a high cost. High precision sometimes is meaningless, uh, should not be considered. And this is the crux of soft computing. So role of soft computing. Physiology, neural computing, genetic algorithm, physiologic algorithm for dealing with imprecision and uncertainty, neural network machine learning for learning and curve fitting, genetic algorithm for structure optimization. And rough set theory we have introduced from our department another uncertainty arising from granularity. I will explain that on. Here, uncertainty coming from overlapping concept, here, uncertainty coming from granularity in the domain. Now, probability uncertainty, if you can bring, it will be even much more powerful. And within soft competing, they are complementary rather because I mean, they do not fight with each other, rather they, they help help each other. For example, if you take this synergistic integration of four tools that we already explained, sorry. Now, instead of gradient descent charge, because gradient descent charge is a very slow process. Why slow? Because if the number of nodes and parameters increases, the search space becomes completely complicated. So in order to remove this, you can make a genetic algorithm based tuning. And it gives a parallel set of solutions, 8, 10, whatever. Now, again, since it is a supervised system, because you know the data set, the partial data information you have. So from that data, if you can extract the domain knowledge, I can encode within the network parameters. So my network starts learning from a better position instead of, of raw position. Therefore, learning time will be drastically reduced. So if I can, this is just a simple example that we published here, I think, 1998 in transaction neural network that time. So if you can make a full way of uh, technology integration, you reduce, you improve the classification performance, you reduce the competition training time, your network compactness increases. What is network compactness? That is all network links are not required. If you add more network links, the system becomes complicated and the rule that you generate will be, it's a possibility that rules should be ambiguous. And generate rules of higher accuracy, smaller size, less competition. So what do you mean by network competition? For example, this for speech, six vowel class, you see that thing, all links are not appearing. This is the beauty that the network becomes compact. So when my network is compact, means time of uh, training will be less, and also the rule you generate from output to input that will be less ambiguous. So around 2000, your web data came www genome project that started producing large and heterogeneous data. Then all partition theory that you develop. It got stop starting because there we assumed number of samples is much much higher than the number of features. But here it is becoming other way. If you go to a medical genome data gene project RNA, your number of uh, patient is small, but number of genes is few thousand. Because you go to doctor or hospital to give your blood only when you are sick, so that. Classification theory, multivariate analysis, which was 
first basic assumption was number of samples should be much, much higher than number of features. You cannot use. So there is called, then data mining become a buzzword around 2000. So what is what is data mining from Patterson point of view? Data mining has three components, statistical component, DVMS component, and the Patterson component. For Patterson component, it is a, when you apply Patterson machine learning, it applied to very large heterogeneous database, large in terms of both size and dimension. And heterogeneous. Heterogeneous means data has not only numerical value, but linguistic, color, attribute set, TikTok, everything. Just like in a newspaper, what you have? Text, image, link, all those things. So you cannot use straightforward pattern regulation technique. And there the basic concept of clustering, they do not follow. So data mining plus knowledge interpretation, because data mining has no value unless you make interpretation in terms of own language, touch a language called knowledge discovery. So it's a basic process of identifying valid, novel, potentially useful, and ultimately understandable patterns in data. That is in around 2000. Now, I will explain what is upset theory, because upset theory mentioned, upset theory it was explained in 1981 by Professor Paula from Poland, which is another land, uh, land of mathematics. It's a crisp set defined over a crisp granulated domain. What is the granulated domain? Just like in school, every section can be considered as a because the section is defined in terms of their age group or sex or marks of the previous group. In an image, every pixel can be considered a granule. Any region of uniform color or intensity can be called as a granule. More importantly, in the gray image, as I mentioned, because of the sinusoidal variation, this is responsible for generating fuzziness. On the other hand, the discretization of the x-axis, y-axis, and the yeah, intensity level, they are responsible for generating granularity. So, keep set defined over a granulated domain. For example. This is my inverse x-axis, y-axis. These are my set graduates. That means here all elements cannot be discriminated with the help of the given relation B, with the grail of this B. If I increase another z, the size of the granule will be, will be changed. So given this granulated, given this feature space B, Given this granulation based on certain relation, I define a crisp set X. Now I see that I cannot define the crisp set uniquely because it is defined over a granulated domain. However, I can make it approximate from inner side from outer side. Inner side means in terms of the yellow granules, which definitely belong to this set. I call it lower approximation of this crisp set defined over the granule. And another is an orange, which is called upper approximation. So here, upper approximation includes includes lower lower approximation. So this is called lower approximation when they definitely belong to this cluster set. And upper means definitely as well as possibly belong. And this possibly belong, they create uncertainty. Because in, in real life problem, life is not so easy. Now, if you see that, you keep in mind, lower means definitely belonging, definitely plus possibly belonging. So any crisp set defined over a granulated domain can be approximated or can be represented in terms of a pair. And that constitutes what is called rough set of X. And therefore, nothing but a crisp set but with rough description so that's why you can give thousands of ready-made uh, example of, of the fuzzy set theory, like long street large number beautiful lady blonde hair and so on but in case of rough set you cannot give because set is crisp defined over a rough description so rough set and this rough description a vague definition of crisp set in terms of lower and upper approximation they signify the incompleteness of knowledge about you. And then in this and this incompleteness is knowledge of about you is coming because of the granularity. If there is no granularity, there is no incomplete knowledge. 
set will be there will be no no roughness in the set roughness comes because of the granular therefore if i can reduce the incomplete knowledge i can make a decision so when i will make a decision using rough set theory my objective will be to minimize this incomplete So it had two examples. I learned it, picked up this subject when I was working at NASA Johnson Space Center for two and a half years. Because that time, you, you I don't know how many of you know, NASA not only does research in space, but also they fund to college, university, and uh, small scale industries for internship problem, PhD problem also. So those interns from uh, East European country, they are very good in maths. They used to come for two months, three months. And now they have to give a talk because they're interested because they're taking fellowship. So I picked up those subjects that time. Uh, I had little knowledge about patterns and image processing, nothing else, how you said, and some neural networks. But I checked that these two concepts, granular computing, because they are information granule, uh, concept of granule. So an uncertainty modeling using lower and upper approximation. That time, expert system was a buzzword. Every time there is a buzzword I told you, I will explain later on. So everybody is publishing using fuzzy set or rough set for designing expert system for medical uh, 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 decision making or law interpreter because medical experts knowledge you cannot encode in zero one. Either there is a roughness or fuzziness, uncertainty. So what is granular computing and information granular? I will tell because I, I had granular computing concept was not there in mind, but I can see that if you use the concept of granule, then you can uh, play with the complex information. And that's what I'm explaining now, these two basic concepts for machine learning. Right? Granular computing, information granule. So granular computing, basically it is a information processing paradigm that works with the process of information granulation or abstraction. And second phase, where computation is performed using information granules, not the data. That means you forget about all data. You extract some information, abstraction, and play with this abstraction. And since abstraction means compressed information, therefore you gain in computation time. That is a possibility. That's why for the last 10 years, we have been using, developed the subject granular computing based on the notion that it has certain merits, particularly for reducing the computation and handling large data sets. Because you are, you are not interested to give exact result, but you are interested in giving an approximately close resembles the result. And if any of you want to give the exact relation the result, you can start from that point instead of starting from the raw position. And what is the information granule? Say, for example, a toy example. This suppose this is a concept or data or region, whatever you think. This is my granulation, just toy example. So given this data, concept of region, whether it is labeled or unlabeled, that means whether you know its origin or you do not know its origin, that means whether the system is supervised or unsupervised, rough set theory can encode this class with the help of this rectangle. That means first feature is medium and second feature is medium. That means simple rule. And this rule or this rectangle it provides a crude description of the class. And in my most of the data mining problem, this approximation is enough. However, if you need the exact shape, you start from here. And interestingly, this is a toy example, both features have appeared. There are real life problems, all features will not appear. appear. Therefore, Therefore, if all the features do not appear, that means all features are not equally important, therefore re dimension reduction is inherent. That means, this is a toy example of compact. Now we have got elongated object. If you elongated object, we have got multiple such granules. And all granules may not have same number of features. Therefore, you have a variable dimension reduction. This is the beauty. So it has application to data compression. It has application for case reasoning representation and 
as well as from granular computing, because you can perform the further operation based on this relation. Now, what is upper and lower approximation in an uncertain model? Says so this is a machine. So suppose this is a cluster. I know that in a cluster, ambiguity regarding its belonging of a pattern to this cluster comes from mostly from the boundary. If the data is around the center point, there is no one. There is no ambiguity regarding their belonging. Therefore, we can consider that this is my core, this is my boundary. So in the notion of rough set, I can call, this is a lower approximation, this is this plus this together, upper approximation. Therefore, I can define lower, upper, etc. Then this is my boundary, that I can define roughness of this cluster beta equal to one minus cardinality of lower divided by cardinality of upper. Because if lower equal to upper, then after zero. That means lower will be equal to upper only when there is no, no granularity. Therefore, now interestingly, when Professor Pavlov defined it, he didn't define it for knowledge discovery. He defined it for mostly for dimensional reduction from features which are not real, which are not correlated. If you are correlated features, then rough is not useful. If the features are uncorrelated, for example, when you go to a medical hospital, what do you give information? Your patient's name, family background pathological test, some measures are tick tac etc. So they didn't generate the data as because some data scientists will come and use a machine learning tool for classifying normal and cancer. This is the data. Now, when you collect it, you see that there are so many features, but all features are not correlated. So then you can, so rough set theory gives a better uh, Result. That's why it becomes so popular. Now the thing is that here set and granules are also considered to be crisp in the Professor uh, Paula's theory. But in real life problem, set could be fuzzy, granules could be fuzzy. Why is set fuzzy? Because in a gray image, if I say that what is the object? Object has no precise boundary, therefore it could be fuzzy. Similarly, if you work with a three by three window for image. 3 by 3 window could be dis disjoint, it could be overlapping. Therefore, this gives rise to concept of generalized rough set, which is a stronger model for answer. Why is it stronger? That if we handle the uncertainty by using either fuzzy set or using rough set, you cannot have better than you, you judicial design. Again, we are not bringing out probability uncertainty. That means uncertainty arising from probability of occurrence of an element. If you put it together, it will be more. So it is uncertainty due to overlapping region, uncertainty due to granularity. Now it has so many applications because any data, whether small, medium, big, uncertainty is obvious because of the deficiency in information. Therefore, let's consider only one of them, given our time. So I will show the example of rough lower upper approximation and the significance of that. First one, the challenging issue, unsupervised video tracking when handling overlapping or occlusion object. Listen, occlusion object I will track and it is unsupervised. I have no knowledge about this. So I will use prediction based method. So why use, use the concept of rough filter. It gives output of any, I have video means sequence of frames, sequence of image frames. I can take the RGB and then the uh, temporal difference, difference. That's the only information I have. I have nothing. So now if I give the sequence of P frames and passes through a filter, its output gives lower approximation of an image, our approximation of an image. That means lower approximation of ob object model, upper approximation of object model. Lower means definitely belonging, upper means definitely as well as possibly belonging. And those model indicates in terms of color, in terms of location, please. And, and this out of this, and based on the sequence of lower and upper, in the next P plus one frame, you can estimate its location based on again, lower and upper. And then you compute the roughness. If roughness is low, below a threshold, I call it that there is no overlapping, you track it. If roughness is high, that I call no, there is a overlapping. 
So then you take the boundary because you know the uh, upper and lower, you take the difference and the boundary, you put it either in the object or background and say, see, another uncertainty to define intrinsic entropy, whether it is reducing or, or it is uh, increasing. If it is increasing, then you put their details. So it handles uncertainty. So what is the tricks? You take a image frame, you compute the difference between the three previous frames. T, T minus 1, T, T minus 2, T, T minus 3, T minus 4. And you take the integration. So if there are P frames, P best frame, you get union of P square 1, P by P matrix. Now another one is that take T, T minus 1, T minus 1, T minus 2, T minus 2, T, T minus 2, T minus 3. So you get P frames. So you take, if you have a background on electrical engineering, say you take input output relation, it's convolution. If there is a P frames and there's a one frame. So it is a P to one point convolution that results in P lower matrix approximation of the object, P upper approximation frames. And how do you get the lower? You take the intersection, you get the lower, that is, which will belong into both object and background, this A1. And if you take the union, and out of this union, you will take only those granules which have non-empty intersection of the lower. So that's how you generate lower and upper. For example, this is a three by three that it is at one bit. Convolution, lower, upper. Based on this, you find estimate their displacement, rate of displacement and so on. As I mentioned, you predict in the next uh, fourth frame and see the one tracking. Tracking. See the oblique on. It's a frames per second 15, previous frame 6. See, uh, completely occluded, but it's a based on prediction, you can do that. Similarly, say in, a, in a laboratory, because I will use this from for deep learning also. See, two persons, two, two, two different frames. Instead of considering one object, it's two objects. Now you see, the, similarly, if you go for micro RNA ranking, what is the challenge here? As I mentioned to you, it's a small sample, large dimension. So you cannot use typical attention techniques which you developed before 80s. So there we can have the set of crisp cancer or normal, it's a crisp decision, but granules are fuzzy. Therefore, you can use lower approximation means definitely belonging, upper approximation means definitely positive belonging, and from definitely belonging, you can compute the relative probability of definite and downfall samples, and you can define entropy, and you minimize entropy, and you see that only 1% microRNA gives better results than if you consider the all microRNA. That means other microRNAs are junk as long as neural, as, as long as cancer transmission is concerned. They might have other values. I'm not going into the detail. Now, in summary, you have seen uh, granular view, I have mentioned it short. These are basically machine learning tools. I have shown two examples, but you can use it for video conceptualization, drug resistant microRNA, social link prediction in social uh, online data. The link prediction is a very hot topic. Link prediction. The neural network generation, that is generation of hallmark. Now, whatever you do, you should keep in mind that where are they leading to? Next slide. So these are a few areas. Computation theory of perception, natural computing, big data learning. What is big data analytics? So it is originated about 10 years back, 2010, big data. Uncertainty modeling and granular mining of point of view, and it has seven day application for COVID-19 detection screening. So many papers have appeared in the last one year. You have got granulated deep learning. That means reducing the competition. What is the going, going deep learning? You know that uh, deep learning means performance depends on the number of samples. A, any kind of machine learning. If you have more number of previous examples, machine learning in one sentence, what is called? How do you how do you say define? 
So learning patterns from a data. Learning patterns from data is in one sentence what you are the machine learning. Learning patterns of it. Pattern means anything. It goes beyond the dictionary meaning. So larger the number of examples, larger the number of patterns, you have better learning. But on the other hand, it will increase the competition time. And for deep learning, you need more data, more data in order to learn in depth in different stages because it is an advanced form of machine learning. So here I give a simple example, CNN. So many, everybody is talking about conventional network, conventional network for the last five years. So many papers are coming. So what do we do? Instead of uh, playing with the conventional layer entirely pixel by pixel, if you make a granule, suppose from 32 by 32 image, we convert it to N granule based on similarity of color. And then this neighbor is called special color similarity. Special and neighbor by with respect to threshold. Then N is much, much less than 32 by 32. So I reduce the competition time, but at the cost of some accuracy. So you have to make some, nothing is free. So look at the example. Deep learning without granulation and with granulation three by three simple rectangular granule and arbitrary shape granule. You look at the speed in CPU, 1.6 plus five second, 2.2, 2, 2. Accuracy, tracking accuracy falls from here to here. Accuracy of detection reduces from here to here. Now let's consider these two very close. Still, you see that you are gaining. The same laboratory image. Look at the recognition score of object and background. Static background and object. I think percent recognition score very high, 80 and 90 percent acceptance. So with this granulation, still you are able to recognize those background as is all, because background has nothing to do, object also. Now, similarly, one uh, recent paper I will not explain, is a granulated region-based uh, CNN. They are also you see, just is appeared, real-time detection speed and accuracy. So let's come to the last slide. Evolution of the of the discipline. That should should be very careful for all your young researcher students. If you look at the patterns of subject originated in 1960s, if you go by the Google search, I didn't know it, but we, uh, I thought it is in 70s. Because in India, PIFR, India Soup Science, and IISC. At our ISI, they started working around similar time using uh, speech recognition problems. The image processing in the 70s, when I went to Imperial College, that time one group at Maryland College Park, Rosenfield. The AI machine learning there come in, came in 80s, I told you. But that time AI machine learning could not flourish much. The term machine learning was coined that time. But learning was there during pattern show also. Expert system was a buzzword that time. Just see around all 10 years. The knowledge-based system, that means you, you extract some kind of knowledge from the uh, domain and you use those power. And India had five such knowledge-based centers, one in IIT Kanpur, one in India Sub Science, one in PIFR, one in ISI Calcutta, and one in CDAC Pune. That was the UNDP project. Then data mining came in to 2000 because of DINOM project and WWW. And all the theories that you developed since 80s, up to 80s, you cannot use them, as I mentioned to you, because data has changed. Features all are uncorrelated, number of sample is less, number of dimension is more, and so on. Then big data came in 2010, America is driving, and we are all following. Now, as soon as big data issues are not, we are talking about deep, learning and data driven side, that means data science. However, all this evolution, they are coming because of the new approaches of different tasks of pattern recognition to handle varying nature of data and decision making. 
So people are working for theoretical work, but theoretical work has no value unless you use for, for practical data. For example, in this paper, which is highly cited, what we did, say, feature selection. In, in, in the 70s, when we started working in feature selection, number of sample is more, number of feature is few, three to four or two. So what we do, we clustering in the sample space such that for which feature set, clustering is much better. That means clustering is more separate. But here now it is other way around. The number of features is few thousand, number sample is fair. So we cluster in the feature space. And after, if you can reduce from few thousands to few tens, then I can take the peak center of each cluster and I call this area reduction. So all the basic concepts have been changed now. So that's why new and that time we used to call classification. Now you call it uh, machine learning, and they call it retriever. Then we call it feature selection. Now you call it feature dimension. Either. Then we used to call subset selection. I call it a uh, data condensation. So all user friendly terms. So new terms and technology coined with a big hope, but in for deep learning, but with the caution. Why caution? If you look at the neural networks when it started in it is a big hope. So many journals. Too much expectation. After 10 or 12 years, subject died. Many journals, they have changed their names. IT transition neural network, they have changed the name to neural network and learning system. They are supporting publishing support vector machine. Neural computing application, they are publishing other paper because journal name cannot be changed. So why it is changed? Because they did not, they have much expectation without developing the theory. theory. So I hope that deep learning again the way it is it is going on CNN, and CNN, and CNN, and you uh, AlexNet, you train it, AlexNet train it, you publish to anywhere. I'm seeing the journal. So when I see the review papers, it will not go further. Maximum five to seven years again, new subject will be again appeared, uh, will be dictated by America, and we will follow. However, for your better because India is investing lots. All, all centers. Uh, my suggestion is that you look at the start a subject form, pattern recognition, image processing, because any data, most of the data has image component. You learn basic things, then you come for shallow learning. So instead of, if you want to learn deep learning, you have to learn shallow learning. If you want to learn shallow learning, you have to understand neural learning. If you want to understand neural learning, you have to understand pattern recognition. So without learning pattern division, shallow learning, conventional and machine learning, neural learning, you cannot use deep learning concept. So if you understand then, if you understand the lacuna, then and only then you will be able to contribute theoretically significantly and supported by data. Now data is abundant, you cannot blame. At our time, we used to we had to generate data. So this one I conclude and I uh, acknowledge my students and younger colleagues in India and abroad, because my entire work mostly, almost with our students and younger colleagues, and I am holding a national science chair. Uh, thank you very much. If you have any question, yeah, I think it is little. Um, thank you so much for the talk, sir. Uh, if Anyone in the audience has uh, questions, uh, I request you to ask them. Uh, Anirudha had PM'd a question to me earlier. Anirudha, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Yes. Hello, sir. So yes, I have please. a question on uh, speech recognition. So speech yes. recognition, from what I've read, uh, hidden Markov models are mainly used to do speech recognition. So what is the advantage of using the Fuzzy logic and uh, backpropagation approach uh, versus hidden Markov models. No, 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 no. Don't actually just compare uh, compare that. Hidden Markov model is based on probabilistic model. Okay. It has certain merit. Okay. Fuzzy logic based approach when you did, we do not consider probability of occurrence, and the fuzziness comes from as I as I mentioned to you in a speech because it is a uh, pattern of biological origin. Okay, mm -hmm. 
and it it manifests inherits certain kind of uh, fuzziness in the sense that between o a a e all the speech and even in the words they have, have ill defined boundaries so in order to handle those impreciseness in the boundaries or ill definedness or vagueness then you can do but uh, which, uh, hidden markov model has no alternative that is one this so they all supplement they do not uh, do not uh, compete with with each other okay and neural network modeling is another non parametric model or a and hidden markov model is a parametric model you need to uh, uh, assume certain distribution but in case of neural network it's a uh, non parametric model i said also non parametric model you do not need to uh, uh, assume any kind of of distribution only beauty is that if there is a pocket if there is an uh, in the data then if x then y if x then y the learning becomes very effective if there is no pocket the neural network network cannot help okay sir thank you ha huh. say so you think always you are don't don't consider what is the competitive etc you look at this every tool has certain limitation every tool has sat kind of matter of convenience you think that way one is parametric one is non parametric if your data is small if the data doesn't obey something then no option of going by uh, parametric model Uh, all right so if no one else in the audience has questions sir we our team had some questions and we had taken some questions in the form so yes please yes yes please uh, so sir you founded the machine intelligence unit now uh, the idea of machines being intelligent so the one of the concepts in ai is artificial general intelligence that a machine um, should be able should be should have the capacity to understand or learn any intellectual task that a human being can do so now do you where do you stand on whether it is possible whether it is achievable uh, yes uh, yes yes i understood artificial general intelligence now we now we just new term coined up because artificial intelligence that is catered to you a just particular job good but to doing but, but uh, learning how to how to just learn another topic Learning how to do another topic that is called artificial general system. So that subject is still open. Eh? I should not make any comment, but obviously our objective is is just towards this because artificial intelligence that has has a narrow limitation. That's why when we when we develop the uh, our our unit or design the subject, we did not give the name artificial intelligence. We give the name artificial uh, general machine intelligence because it takes care of uncertainty. artificial intelligence generally if you look at the classical intelligences they what do they do they deal with uh, reasoning searching etc uh, learning portion is not there uh, similarly uncertainty modeling is, is is just just not there that's why uh, i was asked several times what is the difference i said no it it goes beyond that so machine intelligence includes artificial intelligence but that time we didn't have the concept of artificial general intelligence because that time artificial intelligence was not that much popular also now it is popular now we are talking about artificial general intelligence which our human mind has human mind has but the, again you have to think about our limitation also even we are not able to generate or develop any particular ai model which is applicable to more than one or two tasks This is a limitation of any patternian technology since 1960s, and that suffers criticism. Similarly, image processing, and similarly AI. Whatever you do for speech, you cannot use it for image. Whatever technology you develop. So AI, let us assume now for the time being, it is good for only particular task, etc. But we need human mind works for higher than that. that's why the new term came artificial general intelligence that means how to learn to learn a just just a subject how to learn to learn to this able to solve a solve another another problem so that issue we are handling one of my students who has now joined in iit jodhpur she worked in the area of this machine mind development which is a part of artificial general intelligence but at this moment 
Yes, you can can you can think of since it is a now era of AI and machine learning, you can think of that these two problems together. Two problems together. But again, I will say, don't expect too much that it will be a miracle. So you take a since if you are a graduate student, you take a small problem and go in mind in inside, inside, inside depth. Don't increase the breadth now. And if you can solve one problem, et cetera, then it will be a very good just contribution. However, you keep your overall uh, intelligence, artificial or general or whatever you say, keep, keep, keep it in mind. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have one more question from the audience. Uh, Neeraj Jain asks, is it possible to reduce the input data for learning? using granulated deep learning for remote sensing data? Uh, uh, because remote, see, uh, that is a, a typical question. Yes, granulation, one of the objectives is that you uh, abstract information from that of the data. And the granules evolve during the evolution of the process. Because, because granulation computing is basic elements called granule. And you play with the granule. And the next question comes, yes, sir, how do you define the granule? I didn't go into the all details. Ganus evolved in the process of evolution, in the process of performance. That means Ganus you extract from the data. It could be in the physical domain. It could be in the transformed domain. The example that I give you, information granules, that, I, that means we have developed, we have uh, described the entire data in terms of some rule. Then play with the rule. On the other hand, for this video that the granule we have used, that is in the spatio color granule. That you make a kind of clustering. For example, what is a, what is a granule? When I'm just giving a talk in the audience, what I see? Some set of young boys, young girls, old people in front of them. So I can see usually the are girl, boy, some mixed one, some old people. Similarly, when I look at the at a scene, what, what I see at a glance? Some sky, water body, vegetation, and something. So instead of looking element by element, human brain has a, the capability to grab the abstraction in forms of certain kind of brain. That means universe is fine grain, but we are making it coarse grain, coarse. That is what is called that we are losing some information, but we are abstracting some information. A granular computing is an approximation process. Neural network is also an approximation process. So yes, from remote sensing data, if you are increasing, reducing the number of bands, you can reduce. If you have the number of data, then yes, you can take this into the image. Depending on your problem, all depends on your problem. What do you want to have? All are problem dependent. You can have special color granule. You can have special temporal granule if it is a video data. Then you reduce the data, reduce the information from ten by 10, yeah, from n by n matrix to c number of of, of of the granule, and then play with this granule. The granule means you can play with the centroid. You can play with some other high level information that you extract from this. Yes, you can. But again, all depends on the final task that you are dealing with. Is it actually clear? Could I yes, uh, keep you happy or not? Yes, sir. I received a thank you in the private message. See, for, see, see, this is the problem for any kind of data. Any kind, that's why I call the domain knowledge. That's why you are bringing, we call it data driven science. That data has their own peculiarity. And one technology that you develop for here, you cannot use ready for, for others. However, we always we try to give some kind of guideline that this method will work for this, this kind of data, provided you have this characteristic. This will work for this kind of data, provided you have, have, have this, this characteristic. But the machine notion is that you forget the individual information, you collect some abstracted version and play with this abstracted version.
thank you, sir. Uh, I had we had one uh, last question. Um, so you talked about uh, the fact that this is now data driven science. So uh, data a lot of times has some bias and as we uh, as algorithmic systems and uh, machine learning systems make decisions about our lives. So the idea of ethics in AI uh, is becoming important. So say if if an algorithm is processing my house loan, so can I trust that algorithm to be fair? Um, how do you uh, when you're designing algorithms or when you're making these systems, how do you take that into account? No, it actually just depends on the the uh, practitioner. This is a practitioner. You are right that that has a bias. So if it is a bias, then it needs a pre-processing technique. But if it is an ethical issue, then ethical committee should just take care of that. To me, you give you a data, I'm giving some analytics. You give me a data and you tell me what you want. I want to do, I want, I, I, I can promise you to give an efficient analytics, which will give you this result. But whether this data has biasness, then that needs to be done. That's why I call pre-processing is there before. And, and just if there is any kind of ethical issue, that's what, so for that we should have ethical committee because you know that now for biological any data, if you publish there, well, you have to declare that yes, it has the clearest from ethical issue. So, and also another issue is called security issue. But we are not handling in our this, uh, Research what are we doing? Security matter. Security matter. That is another another the another part. My simple question is that you give me data, you tell me this this. I'm I'm giving all these machine learning tools, machine learning algorithms, just a fuzzy set, rough set, granular computing, probability engineering, neural network based. What about the one possibility? It could be probabilistic reasoning, so that you give. Thank you, sir. Um, I think I think we'll end here. Um, if no one in the audience has questions, uh, thank you so much, sir, for coming. Thank you very it was, much. Thank it was a pleasure to hear you. We should actually uh, all the best, uh, best for this class club. This is just a good uh, endeavor you have made it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, we will follow closely with the updates related to the club and uh, we let we let end the meeting right now thank you sir thank you thank you All right. Um, so, okay. So we leave. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. We'll make hostel WhatsApp group soon. And you can hear from us on Discord. You can, I think Abar has put very kindly all the links. Um, you can look at that. Uh, thank you so much for attending. All right. Bye. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you.